Welcome to AUC Author Series. In this series of programs, we interview the authors in the Atlanta University Center community and introduce you to their latest published works. This program is produced by Brad Oss and Daniel Lee. Our guest today is Dr. Arthur Pindle, lecturer in the philosophy department at Spelman College. Dr. Pindle will be talking about his book, Bayou St. John. Dr. Pindle, thank you for being with us today. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your latest work, uh, Bayou St. John, today? It's a historical novel about uh, antebellum New Orleans. Uh, it takes place starting in uh, 1825. And you have uh, two fugitives. One is a French aristocrat who has to flee France after killing uh, somebody important in a duel. And uh, so he comes over to this country and uh, he runs into uh, a runaway slave who's trying to escape because he's killed an overseer in a fight. And so they're both fugitives and they'll both be killed if they're caught. So they make up this uh, phony master-slave relationship, and uh, they escape to New Orleans, and they, they're sort of pretending because uh, to have a slave is like the, uh, having a house or a car. I mean, you have to have paperwork. <laughs> they didn't have any paperwork, so that's right. a problem. And so it sort of complicates the relationship because they can't do anything. He can't even give him his freedom without the papers. So they just have to pretend to be master and slave, and so they just make a life in New Orleans and get involved in, uh, well, a lot of the craziness of New Orleans. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what inspired to write um, for you to write this novel about uh, New Orleans in the early 1800s? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I was reading another book. It was called uh, Time on the Cross, which is uh, it's an economic analysis of the institution of slavery, and. Uh, as I was reading that, that's when I became aware of what's called the entrepreneurial slaves in New Orleans. Uh, you have slaves who had jobs, they owned businesses, they lived by themselves, and they, they pretty much lived alone. They earned their own money, and their only obligation to their master was that uh, on a weekly basis or so, the master would come around and take some of their money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was pretty much it. Otherwise, uh, they were pretty much on their own. And uh, I had never heard of that. And you never see it in any depictions of slavery. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, I, I said, somebody needs to write a book mm -hmm. about this. And when I thought about it, I said, well, if I don't do it, I might not get done. So I said, well, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> so I decided to write it. All right. Well, I understand also that you are not a native of New Orleans, and you actually moved to New Orleans to do research to yes. begin writing about this book. Can you tell us a little more about your experience while living in New Orleans and learning more about the uh, New Orleans society during the early 1800s? Yes. Well, uh, one of the things about I learned about New Orleans is that they are, they're very proud of their history, uh, sometimes uh, too much so. Uh, I think they're still trying to live their history, and they, they have a for hard time sometimes coming into the 21st century. Right. Um, but they, they are, they, they've got tremendous resources. Uh, you have the uh, Amistad Center at Tulane University, which has an enormous collection of material on, on slavery, and then you have the uh, public library there in New Orleans, and they have an enormous collection. They're very proud of their history, and they have lots and lots of material. For anybody who wants to do research about New Orleans, there's a lot of, lot of material there. They're very proud of their history. And uh, that's, that's one thing. I, I never... I've lived in other places, but nobody really seem so focused on making sure that their history is preserved, like New Orleans. I mean, they, they really put an effort into making sure that, and it's it's worth it because it's a very unique place. I mean, you can see from the book, I mean, there was no place like it. 
Yeah, I um, I really enjoy reading about this book, although it's just a novel, but it's actually based on historical facts, and it's about um, the struggle between men, women, black, white, English, French, rich, poor. Right. Um, it was it was really dynamic, but the character that impressed me the most was uh, Yvette Osborne. Can you talk a little bit more about Yvette Osborne as uh, an African American or Creole living in society at that time? She was she was a victim uh, of this whole system. The the shortage of women. They would bring uh, the women, the young girls, over from uh, France on a boat, and then the men would just uh, marry them up. But in in the in between time, there were you know, the girls would get married and then there were no more women. Mm -hmm. So they had this institution called like, the Quad Rooms and everybody was really supporting the system because uh, you had, the Quad Room was uh, the uh, a woman, a black woman would uh, have a child with a white man and then this child would have another child with another white man. That would be a quadroom, and it kept going, you know, that child, that would be, they call them ox rooms. I mean, you had all of these terminology for all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, but they were raised to be the mistresses of the white men until the white man could find a, a white lady to marry. Right. And uh, while they were involved, they would have children. Uh, the male children would sometimes be even be sent to France and into Europe to be educated. Uh, the you know, the female uh, children were uh, kept in New Orleans. They were they were educated. You know they go to school up through high school, and they were taught and trained by their mothers to prepare mm -hmm. to be a white man's mistress. Right. And uh, when the relationship broke up, uh, they would be receive uh, funds, they would get a house, some of them would get a business, and so it was an economic system which uh, really benefited them, uh, and they, that's the way they looked at it. Right. Uh, and given the circumstances, um, they thought it was a good deal, and so they, they had no complaints about it, uh, because it did pay off Yvette was a wealthy woman, right? right. <laughs> and that's and that's how she got her wealth right. from from her family, her mother, and, and they just collected all of this stuff from these men, and she wound up in the end right. uh, having all of it for herself. Right. Right. So, uh, and that was that was the system that she right. grew up in. Um, right. And you know, there 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 are a lot of things questions about that but the point is that they did it voluntarily they, they live with it mm -hmm. and this is this is how they they saw it and, and they had no complaints right. about it right. well the, the the process of joining the quadrone did I say that right yes quadrone mm -hmm. is is groomed from the time the young uh, child was born until the time she's to the right. marriage age Talk a little bit about the class structure, how Yvette was encouraged to play with certain members of her of society so that would improve her chance of getting married to a wealthy um, Yes, man. this uh, this goes to something that uh, it was very pronounced in New Orleans, but you find uh, in African American communities uh, around the country, and it because I hear that it comes, it comes up sometimes in class, in the seminars, they talk about it. It's what's called color consciousness. That uh, light-skinned blacks often see themselves as different and above dark-skinned blacks. And in New Orleans, they really considered themselves a different group of people. Uh, you just They just did not mix until after Reconstruction and, and uh, all the Jim Crow laws and the three of everybody pretty much into the same bag. But until then, uh, they really saw themselves as a separate group. They were not part of the black community. 
because they weren't part of the white community. They were just their own separate group, right. and that's how they looked at themselves. Right. And they, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they they didn't uh, mix or, or get involved with uh, the dark darker people, right. uh, and and that that's something that uh, still plagues black communities and you can still see it in New Orleans right, right. that that kind of attitude about color what I find interesting about Yvette was that she was um, a woman before her time she was born into the quadrone system but she refused to be a part of it um, talk a little bit more about how she refused to uh, be uh, to get married to uh, another man in the quadrant system, how the friend she chose to associate with. And what about the time when she decided to put on the, the tignon, even though she's a very, uh, physically she's very much a white woman that no one would right. recognize her as a color woman. But she decided to put on this um, garment to signify that she is a woman of color. Yes. 